Hello class. Uh, I know according to your syllabus, uh, the two online lectures that we're going to have uh, were going to be the Roaring Twenties and the Interwar Thirties. Uh, but since we didn't get to World War I, even though I like to do this uh, lecture in class, we need to get you guys up to speed. So we're going to uh, do the uh, World War I lecture online and a short and abbreviated lecture combining both the Twenties and the Thirties uh, for Wednesday for you guys. Uh, I will not, of course, be in class because Pilisippi is is off and because of bureaucracy and everything, they don't want me showing up at South Doyle. And I won't get to see you guys until after your spring break. So uh, you could watch this during the week when I'm supposed to be there, or you can watch this over your spring break if you want. Um, but I think last class period we got up to... Um, talking about um, the U.S. in the first part of the 20th century. So we've already discussed much of what the United States was doing right around 1900. Uh, the first decade of the 20th century was the decade of progressivism. But it was also a decade of, well, optimism. Western culture was at its height. And when I say Western culture, I'm not just talking about American culture, but Europe was the dominant culture, the dominant uh, economic force, the dominant power in all of the world. I mean, even the United States, which was the economic powerhouse of, of the world in, in terms of manufacturing, still looked to Europe for guidance. Banking and the stock market was, were dictated not by Wall Street and big banks in New York, but instead were still sort of marching to the tune set by the Bank of London and the London Stock Exchange, as well as what's, what was going on on the continent. Now, why was Europe at its height? Well, technology. Technology had driven Europe to become the dominant economic, social, cultural, and military force in the world. And one of the technologies that allowed Western culture to sort of be considered a Western unified culture was communications. The world was interconnected for the first time ever. And this was because of, of inventions like the telegraph and then of course later on the telephone. The telegraph, which you know, most of you would think is a rather crude technology, was essential for sort of holding together uh, Western culture and, of course, making the United States and American culture part of that interconnected Western culture. The first transatlantic telegraph cable was laid in the 1870s. By the 1890s, you had companies like Western Union um, that were providing telegraph service. So you could theoretically you could theoretically walk into a telegraph office in Knoxville and there was probably one downtown and you could theoretically send a message around the world back to yourself and it would go something like this. From Knoxville the telegraph uh, the, the, the message would be sent to New York from New York it would go from uh, there to through the transatlantic cable to London. From London, it would go underneath the channel and then across uh, France to Paris. From Paris, it would run across land to uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Back then, they still used Istanbul and Constantinople almost interchangeably. From Istanbul, Turkey, it would run across um, to probably somewhere around Calcutta, India. From Calcutta, India, it would cut across southern China uh, and probably up the coast to, today we call it Beijing, back then they called it Peking. From Peking, it would run underneath the uh, South China Sea to Tokyo. By 1900, you had telegraph cable, cables laid underneath the Atlantic, so laying on the sea floor, that ran from Tokyo to islands like Midway in the middle of the Pacific and then from there to Hawaii and then from Hawaii all the way to San Francisco and then from San Francisco it would 
you have you would have the overland telegraph cables that f would follow the original transcontinental railroad back to St. Louis and then from St. Louis to New York and then back to Knoxville. And this could all happen within less than a day. Now today, of course, we're going less than a day. Lord, I can get on my freaking iPhone and you know there the, you know have it instantaneously. I can call somebody up in China tomorrow, I mean in in 5 seconds. But in 1900, this was a radical and revolutionary new technology. Now, in the late 1800s, you also had the advent of the telephone. Now, the telephone was a little bit more complex. Uh, we've all seen the, the old school telephone right here, the candlestick telephone. But because of its complexity compared to the telegraph, the telegraph was relatively simple compared to the telephone. The telegraph could be transmitted over longer distances, whereas the telephone couldn't. The telephone in the early 1900s, the first decade of the 1900s, was limited to urban areas. Uh, you could have a telephone if you were a very wealthy person like J.P. Morgan in your own home, and this would allow you to call up uh, your bank in uh, on Wall Street and uh, get news. Uh, but it wasn't until around World War I, around the teens, that you start to see uh, the telephone starting to be a long-distance communication device. Now, both of these technologies, as we talked about before, so let's kind of refresh our memory, allow for uh, American culture in particular, but also Western European cultures to become more, what you might call, unified cultures. Uh, national cultures. Nationalism uh, was sweeping the globe at this time and one of the, th the things that helped push this idea of nationalism was common, common ideas, common beliefs, common ways of dress, common cultural elements like how your house is decorated. I mean things that we wouldn't think would play into nationalism do play into nationalism. And this idea of having a national popular culture is best illustrated by mass media like National Geographic, Good Housekeeping, uh, and other magazines that pop up during this time period. But it's not just communication technologies that showcase Western culture as being the supreme culture on the planet. It's also the, the fact that people in the United States and Europe, especially the United States, are a mobile people. We're mobile people and, especially again in the case of the United States, we have access to consumer goods. Now, you know, the United States from the very get-go was a car-centered culture. You know, by 1908 you had the first Model T, a car that was cheap enough for your average worker to own. And when Henry Ford introduced his mass production in 1913, it lowers the cost by 40% almost and opens the doorway for almost anybody to be able to own one, at least one car. But you also have steamships. Now think about this. How do you get around the world? This is in an era before the airplane is even invented and of course cars can't drive on water. So ships are not only a main form of conveyance, a main form of getting from place to place. They're, they're sort of a mystique to these ships, as we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, these ships will grow from relatively small steel and iron ships powered by steam to colossal creations of engineering. And this allows uh, people in Western Europe and the United States to travel not only within their countries, not only travel uh, where the railroads can take them, but to travel where there aren't, aren't any roads. I mean, the Model T, while it looks very fragile, was a very tough little car. And they, you know, these things went all over the place. And ships would allow people in increasing numbers, and not just the rich, to travel the world. Now, the ease of uh, production and the fact that more and more stuff is being created at this time means that the world is, or at least the United States, is becoming a, a, a middle-class world. A world where instead of having a few incredibly well-made items, 
you have pretty good made items, but a lot of them made at a cheap price. And this is best illustrated by the department store. Places like Macy's and Sears Roebuck's uh, mail order catalogs where you could pr order or buy almost anything. And all of this, whether it be technological improvement, transportation improvement, or consumerism, was made possible by economies that were growing at rates that had been unheard of before this, and sadly, we haven't experienced really since the, this time. And so, the United States and the American people were caught up in this idea of scientific optimism that the world, the Western world, was at its height and it was only going to get higher. It was only going to improve. And this was based on a belief in science. Science had, had come to the rescue of Western society. Uh, medicine, for example had increased the lifespan because during the late 1800s the chemical industry had come up with new drugs like for example bare aspirin. Researchers had come up with new theories like germ theory that disease was caused by little bitty organisms and that if you kill these little bitty organisms germs you can stave off infection. You can make make procedures that up until this time were incredibly risky and almost more deadly than what they were aimed to fix possible. I'm talking about surgery. I'm talking about being able to do surgical procedures to remove cancers, to fix uh, uh, damaged organs, uh, to fix, fix uh, massive injuries. Most soldiers in the Civil War, for example, died from post injury infection rather than from the injuries themselves. Science and medicine offered a reprieve from this. The chemis chemical industry also provided us with, well, fuels. I mean, think about this. Almost everything that you deal with today, you can thank the chemical industry for good or bad. The gas that you put in your car comes from the chemical refining of, of petroleum. Many of your drugs that you take are of course derived from the, the, the processing of chemicals and many of these chemicals again have their origins back in the early uh, petroleum refining days of people like John D. Rockefeller. The plastic in your cell phones or those Apple laptops that you guys use. That all comes from the chemical industry. So new lubricants, new fuels, new um, chemicals in which to uh, speed up manufacturing, solvents, uh, paints, things like that. Drugs, new materials like Bakelite, which is essential as an insulator for early electronics. All of this science promised to make a better world. Now, of course, as we talked about, this new science had a dark side. This new science sort of pointed the way to the fact that those that have the ability to understand science are somehow superior to those that don't have this new science. And this, of course, plays into social Darwinism. And, of course, this, this kind of builds this, this cultural arrogance on the part of people in the West. Now, a growing economy, ease of manufacture, new products lead to a new renaissance in the very late 1800s and the early 1900s. We see a revival in art and architecture. If you looked at many of the houses built during this time, even the even middle class houses, they are incredibly frilly, if you will. Now, one of the big things that uh, comes out out of this new renaissance is the concept concept of leisure time. How many of you have taken a vacation? 
This is a relatively new idea, at least for people who are not incredibly wealthy or entitled because of noble, uh, noble title. Leisure time. The fact that by the first decade of the 20th century, people in the upper middle class, the middle middle class, and even the lower middle class could take off. They could take time. And of course, new, these new transportation technologies f facilitated it. If you were in the working class or the, or the uh, lower levels of the middle class, your vacations were dependent upon usually the automobile or mass transportation like trolleys or the railroads. You know, the middle class who owned their own cars, they could go and escape the cities for a weekend or maybe even a week. They could go and maybe go to a national park if they lived out west. They could go sightseeing. They could go to Coney Island on the coast. They could go to Atlantic City. They could go traveling to places like Nags Head, North Carolina, just to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Now, if you were from the upper middle class or from the elite levels of the upper class, you could travel farther than that. You could afford a ticket on these classic steamships like these right here. Families from the upper middle class and the the upper class itself, the elite upper class, would often send their children on what they termed holiday. You often hear about Europeans going on holiday. Well, holiday was a rather expensive adventure. Um, this is why it was normally limited to the upper middle class and the upper elite classes. Holiday basically was if you were in if you were in Europe, you would travel to the colonies, the, the, one of the main destinations for Europeans, especially the British, was Asia, the, the exotic uh, Orient, as they called it. Uh, if, you were in, if you were a British subject, you would often go to India and experience the exotic nature of the Indian subcontinent. Many times, Europeans would travel to the United States and see, you know, our Old West. They would travel around the United States. Americans, by contrast, would oftentimes travel to Europe. Now, if you were from the upper classes, you could afford a multi, uh, multi-room suite. But if you were from the middle to upper middle classes going on holiday, normally you got a second class ticket. A second class t ticket entitled you to a room with a, uh, a sink in it and it was built like kind of like a dorm room where you had your own private ba bedroom with its sink and then you shared a bath with an identical mirror image room on the other side. Now of course these ships also carry third class or steerage passengers. Usually these people were not going on holiday. Usually these people were immigrating. Um, and these people were, uh, you know, a third class steerage, pa uh, third class steerage ticket uh, was relatively cheap. But it only entitled you to a room that may have six to eight beds in it. And each deck had its own bathroom. So you're sharing uh, a bathroom, not with the room next door, not having a bathroom of your own like the uh, the upper class or the first class passengers. Uh, you had to share it with 20, 40 other people. Now, the interesting irony of this is that the real, the people who really paid for these opulent ships were not the first class passengers. They really were not the second class passengers. It was the third class passengers because even though their their tickets per ticket were cheap, the, the 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 huge numbers that these ships carried were what really paid the gas bill, if you will. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Titanic? While it's a sappy love story, in my opinion, James Cameron, Cameron, the producer and director, did an excellent job of recreating uh, Western culture at the time of the sinking, which was 1912. Now, if you guys can remember this movie, you have Billy Zane's character, uh, a 
nouveau rich American, a man who's just made his money. And of course, he's very arrogant about it. When he had, he and his new wife, Rose, uh, uh, pull up next to the Titanic, um, Billy Zane's character says, not even God himself could sink this ship because of this optimism in science and engineering and technology. Now, Rose, of course, is like, I don't see any difference from Mauritania, another ship. And, of course, Billy Zane's character is like, well, Mauritania is not as opulent. Titanic's 40% larger. And he was right. The class of ships that Titanic was part of, it was known as the Olympic class. The first ship in the class was known as Olympic. The second class was Titanic. And the third class was Britannic. These ships were bigger than any ship built by about 40%. So they were almost half as long as any previous ship. Now this pushed this new technology to its limit. And one reason why Titanic sank as quickly as she did was because the ship had to be designed with certain cushions, expansion joints. If you guys ever drive on a bridge and you feel ba-boom, ba-boom, Boom. Well, those are expansion joints because a bridge has to have some leeway. It has to be able to expand. It has to be able to move a little bit because if it's just solid, completely solid, the stresses on it will cause it to crack. The same is true for large ships. They've got to be able to adjust. The problem is Titanic's expansion joints were the first of their kind and the design failed. So this idea of the ship coming way out of the water and then breaking, well, it's been proven false in recent years. The ship probably barely got out of the water, its, its aft end, its ass, before breaking. And it broke at that expansion joint. So the technology failed those, you know, those Europeans and Americans riding on the Titanic. And a good portion of its, of its passengers died as a result. Now, not even the Titanic disaster could dampen uh, the sort of optimism of this time period. And we're going to see how this optimism uh, plays into the catastrophe of, of World War I. Now, one of the things that I would like to point out is, if you've not already guessed, one of these ships is Titanic. This one, right here. But you're going, well, that one looks almost like it. Well, this is Titanic's sister ship. It's older sister ship, Olympic. Now, Olympic is interesting in that while Titanic sank on its maiden voyage, Olympic, which had the same faulty expansion joints, which had some of the, some of the problems that Titanic had, would sail without incident, would never miss a call, that means arrival uh, at a port, New York, would never miss a call to the point where its nickname was Old Reliable. And she would sail until the early 1930s when she was sold for scrap. And in the mid-1930s, of course, the ship was going to be cut up and she would be finally cut up for scrap. Uh, none other than Teddy Roosevelt, before he died, sent a letter to the British government asking them to preserve the ship as an example of these grand liners of the early 20th century. And also, he mentions that the sister ship of the Titanic should not, you know, should not be done away with. A little bit of interesting trivia for you guys. Now, while Americans and Europeans sort of bask in their collective achievement of technology, transportation, communications, and believe that Western society was only going to get better and better and better and better. There's some undercurrents that are going on at the same time. Now, the first is, of course, nationalism. We've mentioned nationalism before a little bit in class, but let's go into nationalism in, in greater detail. Nationalism is the belief that your society is not only a good society, not only a great society, but nationalism in its more virulent, perverse forms takes on the attitude that our culture, our society, our economic system 
our political system is not only a great system, but it's the best system. And since it's the best system, our culture, our people, have the right to impose it upon everybody else. We have the right to take what we need in the world. Now what is nationalism? What is this belief? What, what, what culture are we talking about? Well, nationalists argue that everyone of a similar background, if you will, so people of a similar ethnicity, a similar religion, who have a similar history, who have similar who have the same language all of those individuals have the right to exist in the same political entity the state a country and in it as i said in its more sort of virulent aggressive form that country that nation state as it becomes known has the right to impose its wills on its neighbor it is this nationalism in its most perverse form, well beyond that of patriotism, that justifies European empire building. As we talked about in the discussion of America, America's experiment in empire building, American imperialists believe that Americans, American, the American nation state, had the right to expand and take over other areas. The Europeans do the exact same thing. They only do it on a grander scale. They take over Africa. They take over much of Asia. They take over the South Pacific. And it's not just one country taking over these areas. Afri Africa, for example, is divided up amongst the, the British, the French, the Belgians, the Germans, the Italians, and one of the problems during this time period is that, well, when they start doing this in the late 1870s, they're starting out at different points along the African coast. But as these colonies grow, by the late 1800s, so we're talking the 1890s, European countries are starting to bump into each other as they draw the boundaries of their new colonies. This gets so bad that in the very late 1880s, in 1886, the European powers, the European leaders meet in Berlin at a conference that becomes known as the Berlin Conference, whereupon they take out a map of Africa and they, do, they draw the boundaries. They don't consult the people who live in Africa. They just draw it up themselves according to their interest. The hope is simple. If we define where our boundaries are in Africa, our colonial forces will not get in a fight with each other, and a colonial war would more than likely lead to a European-wide war. And this is one thing that, at that time, they want to avoid. Now, between the 1880s and World War I, 1914, we also see a military arms race. Now, the arms race of the early 20th century is not building up aircraft or nuclear weapons. It has to do with warships, most notably the battleship. Now, the story of this naval arms race is m much more complex than I can tell you here in this short lecture, but I'm going to try and give you some semblance of what went on. Two things that you have to remember. First, Great Britain is an island nation highly dependent on foreign trade it's dependent on its merchant marine you know cargo ships it has a huge navy the royal navy in order to support its merchant marine but also support its vast far-flung empire now germany on the other hand is a recently assembled a recently uh, a, a country that has just recently come into being Germany was not even a country before the 1870s. Instead, it was a collect, sort of a collection of small German states. They had a common or similar language, a similar history, a similar culture. And German nationalists, ever since the 1840s, had been pushing for Germany to unify. 
in the late 1860s and 1870s, Prussia, one of the more powerful uh, German states, would fight a war with first its main rival within those German states, Austria, and then with France in order to secure sort of the most prominent role in Central Europe and become sort of a magnet from which all these other German states would coalesce around. So in 1876, Germany as we know it was born. Now, most of these small German states were landlocked. Only the ones along the Baltic had navies. And those navies consisted mainly of small coastal defense vessels, not ocean-going warships. However, the new Kaiser, who comes to power in the very late 1890s, the son of the Kaiser of Prussia, who would become the first Kaiser of Germany, Wilhelm I, well, his son, Wilhelm II, is a, well, a fan of the navy. He gets his sort of his his uh, obsession with naval power from two things. First, Wilhelm II vacationed on warships when he was a child. Not German warships, but British warships, because Wilhelm II is the cousin of both Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and King George of Great Britain. They're all grandchildren of Queen Victoria of England. And so, Wilhelm saw what a navy did for, well, his family, his extended family, and how the, the king of Britain, of Great Britain, had, you know, was the king of a massive empire because of it. Now, secondly, Wilhelm had just read in the 1890s a very influential book, and it's a book that you guys have heard about. The Influence of Sea Power Upon History by American Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan. In this book, Mahan is basically arguing that Great Britain became the pro most prominent and powerful European country because of its navy. And Wilhelm wants Germany to be just as powerful. And Germany has the economic and industrial tools to back that up because Britain, kind of ironically, is, is, in, is, in, is in industrial decline. What had made Great Britain the foremost industrial power of the early Industrial Revolution were textiles. It was the textile industry in Great Britain that really made it dominant in the world. However, by the late 1800s, textiles were a fading industry. The up-and-coming industry, or actually two industries, were steel and the chemical industry. Across the Atlantic, America dominated in both of these regards. But in Europe, the country that dominated in steel production and the chemical industry was Germany. And so Wilhelm wants to build a navy. However, Wilhelm is not an absolute monarch. Wilhelm II is a constitutional monarch. Because contrary to what most of you probably think, Germany was a constitutional monarchy with its own parliament, a legislature, very similar to Great Britain. Now, the German parliament, or Bundestag, had to ratify all budgets. That's where all the, the, the money came from, is from the legislature, not from the Kaiser, the king. Now, this is where this man, right here, becomes important. Because while Kaiser Wilhelm was a fan of building a large navy, constitutionally, he could not push it through. However, the head of the German Kriegsmarine, their navy, this is Alfred von Tirpitz, who from between 1849 until, oh, I take that back, from 1897, he was born in 1849, from 1897 to 1916, would be the head of the German fleet, the German navy. And during that time period, he would 
shepherd through the German Parliament a series of naval spending bills. Now, how did he do this? Well, Tirpitz phrased the building of a navy in nationalist terms. He argued that any country worth its salt, industrial, worth its worth its weight, worth its worth you know worth of anything, had to have a navy. And the German population and their elected officials bought the argument. And so Germany started to build a navy to rival that of the British Royal Navy. Now here's where history is very ironic. Because Wilhelm here, being kin to the British monarchs, believed that in building a large fleet, Germany would prove itself a worthy ally to Britain and that the Anglo-Saxon people, the Germans and the English, would come to dominate not only Europe, but the world. Now, what Wilhelm and other German leaders failed to realize was that, well, England's an island nation. Their navy is spread out around the world, guarding the sea lanes, guarding these far-flung colonies. Germany, being a relatively relative newcomer to Europe, you know, to the modern world, has a very small empire. Its empire is only about one fifth or one fourth the size of the British Empire. So most of its fleet is not going to be spread out all over the world. Instead, it's going to be located just a thousand miles or less from Great Britain at the major naval bases for Germany, Kiel, Wilhelmshaven, and Cologne. No, not Cologne. Let's see, Wilhelmshaven. Ah, I can't remember what the uh, what the third one is, but Wilhelmshaven and Kiel are the two major ones. And of course, the British react accordingly. The British react by thinking that this is a threat to their own national security, and they start building more ships. And so, by the first decade of the 20th century, you have this arms race as the British and the Germans compete with each other of building not only more ships, but building more advanced ships. Now, Britain has had a leg up because it had a large navy to begin with. And so, in order to justify building a larger navy that caused political instability rather than peace, Tirpitz makes this argument. He argues that if Britain will not side with the Germans, they'll at least have to respect the Germans because they will never risk attacking Germany because the German fleet, while it would be destroyed by the superior numbers of the British, the British fleet would be so badly mauled, so badly hurt in such an encounter that the British would be toppled from their premier place in the European power structure. And thus, not wanting to risk their own fleet against this German risk fleet, as he calls it, the British would instead negotiate and work with the Germans. How wrong, how wrong Tirpitz would turn out to be. Because in 1905-1906, the British up the ante. They build this ship. This is HMS Dreadnought. Dreadnought made all ships before her obsolete because before 1905, battleships, or what would become known as pre-Dreadnoughts, were sm smaller ships, relatively clumsy looking, and they carried a mix of guns, some high caliber, but many smaller calibers so that the ship could engage smaller ships, engage in shore bombardment, and act in multiple different roles, kind of a jack of all trade. Dreadnought was built to be sleek, fast, highly maneuverable, and only carried large caliber guns, initially 12 inches in diameter, and by World War I the standard caliber would jump up to 14 and then 16 inches. This ship had one job and one job only. She was a ship killer. 
thus making all of the warships, all the battleships before her, obsolete. Now, of course, the Germans and other countries like the United States would follow in kind, building their own dreadnoughts. This, of course, only heightens the tension between the, country, the countries. Now, this heightened tension will lead to another side effect of all of these undercurrents that we're talking about. No country wants to fight, alone, fight a war alone. So, beginning in the late 1800s, countries will start to seek out alliances. Now, Germany is one of the first. Germany is a relatively young and, at first, weak country. So, in 1879, right after becoming its own country in 1876, Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire will sign an alliance. This alliance, which becomes known as the Dual Alliance, basically states that if either country is attacked, the other will come to its aid. Likewise, France, not wanting to face an industrialized Germany, seeks out its own allies. Now, France is interesting in that France, while being a populous and relatively strong power in Europe, has not industrialized like Britain or Germany. And so, the French fear that they'll be overpowered by the technologically superior Germans. So, in a weird twist, the French, who in the early, very, you know, the first decade of the, the, the 1800s, of the 19th century, killed their own king, declared a republic, will sign a alliance with the last autocratic monarch in all of Europe. Tsarist Russia. So the French revolutionaries of the late 1700s, early 1800s will become allies with a government that is still dominated by one man, the Tsar, Nicholas II. So Germany and Austria are allied together. They will also ally themselves by 1914 with the Ottoman Turks. Now the Ottoman Turks are often called the sick man of Europe because the Turks had been an incredibly powerful empire in the time period between the 15 and 1600s. They had dominated the Middle East. They had dominated all of North Africa. And they had controlled much of Eastern Europe right here. However, during the first decade of the 20th century, countries like Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, and this country right here, Serbia, would fight and win their freedom from Turkey. Now, the Serbs, you know, the Serbs, they, they're a relatively new and small and weak country. They are sandwiched between former masters and possible future masters. So they are, they're looking for somebody to protect their new independence. And so Serbia makes an alliance with Russia. If anybody attacks little Serbia, Russia will come to their aid by attacking whoever attacks Serbia. Now, this is something that you need to understand. France has no alliance with Serbia. Their alliance with, is with Russia. But if Serbia goes to war, Russia goes to war. If Russia goes to war and thus is attacked by anybody, France has to go to war for Russia. See how all the strings are starting to be formed? Well, Britain is an interesting case because the British government, even though it signs an alliance with France, this alliance does not say that, that Britain has to come to France's aid. The British, on the other hand, are more concerned with this little country right here, Belgium. Because Belgium wants to be neutral. The Belgian government wants to maintain the neutrality of their country. And so, Belgian representatives meet with the British government to secure a guarantee of neutrality. The British promise to go to war if anybody invades Belgium. Now, the Belgians will not go to war if somebody attacks Britain. So what does Britain get out of this? 
Britain gets the neutrality of Belgium. Because think about it, if you're Britain, an island country, you don't want anybody really close to you. And so the British want to keep this area of Europe, northern France and Belgium, as friendly as possible. They do not want to see, say, a hostile German army march into Belgium and into northern France because it's only a couple of miles from here, the Pas de Calais, to the cliffs of Dover. That's what the British are wanting to secure. So we have nationalism. Nationalism running wild, where you have British, French, Germans, all of these all of these these populations believing that their country, their nation state, their national people, all within one state, so a nation state, are the best out there and they should be supreme. You have these colonial disputes as all of these nation states are trying to divide up the world. You have a military buildup, an arms race, so they got more guns to kill each other with. And then finally, you have this alliance system that could easily pull in countries that may not have a dog in the initial fight. This has made that much more dangerous because of how the countries are planning for a future war. Starting in the late 1800s, all of the major militaries in Europe are planning to fight each other. So, I mean, imagine this. In that first decade of the 20th century, where everybody feels that Western society is going to keep on getting better and better and better, under the surface, people are coming up with what coming up coming up with ways of tearing it apart and these war plans are important that you understand their basic outline because none of these war plans have defense as part of them looking to the last major wars which were the, the Napoleonic Wars and the war for German unification in the 1860s and 1870s the countries that attacked first and attacked on the offensive one so all of the war plans whether it be British Russian but especially the French and the Germans they are they are centered on offensive action so regardless of what happens you go on the offensive you attack somebody now the Germans the German plan is created by the head of the German uh, uh, general staff, a fellow by the name of Otto von Schlieffen. Schlieffen understood that Germany, while being a powerful new country industrially, was weak and it was stuck in the center of Europe, which meant it had enemies on both sides. France, you know, had the benefit of, well, having enemies on one side and then an ocean on the other. The Russians, vast space. The Germans, they're located in the relative, relatively small confines of Germany, with France on one side and the behemoth of Russia on the other. So Schlieffen comes up with a plan. Understanding that the Russians and the French might ally, which they actually would in the future, Schlieffen comes up with the plan that regardless of who attacks, you attack France first. So, theoretically, if Russia attacked, you still attack France first. Why? Well, Russia is technologically backward at this time. If you looked at a map of Europe, let's look at a map of Europe. Germany is a spider web of railroads. So is France. But Russia only around St. Petersburg and Moscow, with very few in this area, almost none back here. Russia in the late 1800s, most of its industrial goods do not, you know, do not come from Russia itself. Instead, most of the Russian rifles, the famed Mosin Nagants, are originally built in Paris, France. 
I know this for a fact because I have a friend who, who she has an old Mosin Nagant made in 1896, I believe, and the armory is in France. So the Schlieffen plan calls for, simply put, a German thrust into France through Belgium and around Paris. Once Paris is captured, the French would sue for peace, that's the plan, and that the Germans then could turn their military around, use their superior railroad network, and move their troops back to the German-Russian, well, Polish border right here, so that they could face the huge juggernaut of Russia. Russia has plenty of men. It just can't mobilize them that fast. Now, the French also have a plan. It calls for immediate offensive action if war comes. Now, the French, they've lost two of their, well, they've lost two provinces. These two provinces have been in dispute between France and the German states ever since the time of Charlemagne in the 700s. They're Alsace and Lorraine. In the 1870s, when Germany goes to war with France, not only do, you know, do the Prussians, Prussia's right here, not only do the Prussians defeat France, but they cut off Alsace and Lorraine and make them part of the Second Reich, the Greater Germany. France, of course, wants them back. And so their plan is simple, to attack directly into these provinces, seizing them, and then directly on to Berlin, ending the war. To understand the importance of these plans, you have to understand that these plans, in order for them to work, have to be incredibly detailed. In order for these militaries to, to operate efficiently, their planners believe that lower level officers have to have detailed plans to follow down to the minute because there are no radios. Wire communication like telegraph, well, possibly would not work. And so, in order for troops to know where they're supposed to be, they need to be told where they're supposed to be, minute by minute, hour by hour. And so, what does this mean? This means that you have created an organizational machine. The Schlieffen plan, for example, is something that all you need to do is flick the switch. That once this plan is initiated, the decision-making process is removed from the Kaiser. It's removed from the German Bundestag. It's removed from even some of the highest levels of the military. Instead, this is a plan that is self-perpetuating and cannot be easily stopped. So, we have this powder keg. What's the match? What's the match that lights it? Well, the trigger is the assassination of this man right here. This is Archduke Francis Ferdinand of the House of Austria. He is part of the ruling family that the Emperor of Austria is from, the Habsburgs. Now, Francis Ferdinand is an interesting character in that he's not very popular in the Austrian capital because Ferdinand advocates greater autonomy to the minorities within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is not a popular view for him to hold and as such he is basically run out of the capital and he's forced to go on a fact-finding tour uh, throughout the very minority regions that he has been advocating for. One of them is the region of Bosnia. Now, Bosnia, which, to go back here on the map, is located right here. This is Bosnia. Bosnia is an ethnically mixed area of the Balkans, of southeastern Europe. You have Croats, you have Muslims, and you have Serbs. So about 20 to 30 percent of the, those people who are ethnically Serbian do not live here in Serbia. They instead live here in Bosnia. And so, you know, he is forced out of Vienna and he's driving through Bosnia. 
Now, the capital of Bosnia is a city called Sarajevo. Now, while in Sarajevo, Francis Ferdinand, oh, excuse me, is driving in an open-top touring car. He's tri driving around in a convertible in an area that, well, has terrorists. You have Serbian nationalists operating within Bosnia who would like to see part of Bosnia basically broken off from the Austro-Hungarian Empire and added to Serbia proper. One of these groups is known as the Black Hand. And so while, you know, Francis Ferdinand and his wife are driving through Sarajevo, some people throw some dynamite at his car. His driver is forced to take evasive action. They get lost. And so his driver stops in order to get his bearings, to understand where he's at. And as luck would have it, the car stops right in front of one of the lookouts for the Black Hand. This man was not one of the assassins, or at least intended to be one of the assassins. Instead, he was, set, he was stationed there to look out for the police. But the opportunity was too good. And so this lookout jumps up on the running board, pulls out the six-shot revolver that he was given by you know, the, his bosses, the, the, his sort of handlers, if you will, and, well, puts about three or four of them into the Archduke and two or three into his wife, killing both of them. Now, even though Francis Ferdinand was not sort of the most popular man in Vienna, his assassination will be used as an excuse to basically take Serbia over. Because the Serbians, in late July of 1914, issue an ultimatum to the new Serb government. Basically, the ult ultimatum says that, you know, the, the ultimatum said, you, the Serbian government, are unable to police your own territory. The Austrians are going to send Austrian troops into Serbia in order to keep the peace. And of course, the Serbs refuse. They had just got done throwing the Ottoman Turks out. They're not going to allow the Austrians just to waltz in. And so on July 28, 1914, Austria declares war on Serbia. Of course, this means that Russia declares war on Austria. Germany, coming to the aid of the Austrians, declares war on Russia. And France declares war on both Austria and Russia. This becomes known as the July Crisis. Because in the last week of July and early August, you see first the ultimatum, then the initial declaration of war, and then finally the domino effect of all of those alliances that I just got done speaking of. The war has started. And as such, all of those war plans are kicked into gear. Now, one of the things that you have to understand is when war is declared, most Europeans are not bemoaning this fact. They're not sitting around going, "Oh Lord, we are we are so up, you know, we're all we're so far up the creek without a paddle. We're we're doomed." Just the opposite was true. The war, the the the, the announcement of war came to the sounds of cheers. People happily went to war. Most Europeans were waiting for this because this would be the great determinant of who was finally king of Europe. What country was the best? Now this doesn't mean that all Europeans were you know, clapping the onset of war. Some Europeans saw what could possibly and what would happen. One of them was a fellow who worked for the British Foreign Office, their version of the State Department. And he wrote uh, to all of the colonies, all of the, 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 the governors. And how he phrased this was, the lights go out are going out across Europe. I fear they will not, be, they will not come back on in our lifetime. Because this person basically is saying, what we've worked for, what Europe has been built on, is going to be wiped out. And it's going to be long past any of our lifetimes before that's rebuilt. And in a lot of ways, it has never been rebuilt. 
And so the war starts. That Schlieffen plan kicks off and the Germans pour into Belgium. The invasion of Belgium finally pulls the British in. The British declare war in early August of 1914 because of the German invasion of that neutral country. They rush over a small expeditionary force called the British Expeditionary Force, called the BEF for short, uh, even though most of the early fighting will be carried out by the French, uh, at least on the Allied side. Now the Schlieffen plan falters for two reasons. First, most of the German troops are still dependent on horsepower or foot power. And so think of the Schlieffen plan as a right hook coming around. Those individuals on the inside of the hook have the shortest distance to march, but those guys on the outside, they're having to walk twice as far, twice as fast, and they start to tear, they start to tire out. And so the hook starts to kind of swing in. Likewise, the French, who are mobilizing here around Paris, will use the modern technologies given to Western society by the Industrial Revolution to help blunt this right hook. Now, it's not a technology that the military has. It's a technology that they borrow from the civilian sector because Paris taxis will be commandeered and the drivers will drive troops out of Paris to the battlefront here along the Marne River. This becomes known as the miracle of the Marne because if you look at, you can actually look this up on YouTube. You see these old silent films of these taxis running out of Paris. They look kind of like Model T's even though they're built by Renault or other French manufacturers. But they're of that same design. You have as many troops, like, cl like a clown car, piled into the taxi. You have you know, troops on either running board, hanging off the back, sometimes on the front fenders running out and then of course the taxis will come back and pick up more. This allows the French military to get into position faster than the Germans anticipated and they blunt that right hook as it comes out of Germany through Belgium and instead of swinging around Paris it swings this way in front of Paris along the Marne River. In that first battle the Germans lose it. Now, the French will, of course, counterattack. Think of the, the you know, the counterattacks as trying to get around the, the flanks, if you will, of the enemy. They're following the old tactics as outlined by Napoleon a century before, of maneuver, of trying to gain a, a victory so that you can get behind your enemy to force them to surrender and, of course, win the war. The problem is these counterattacks fail. So you have a French counterattack, it fails. Then you have a German counterattack, it fails. A French, a German, a French. The same up here. A German, a French, a German, a French, a German, a French. This becomes known as the race to the sea because literally going this direction, these attacks will continue until they run out of Europe to fight on. Likewise, they'll follow a similar course until they run into the border with neutral Switzerland. Now, when these attacks fail, what do the armies do? Well, they start to dig in. Initially, it's small, you know, personal foxholes. But by early 1915, you see the beginnings of the trench system, a trench system that we'll talk about later on. By 1916, you could enter this trench system at the French-Swiss border and walk its full length all the way to the North Sea without your head ever being above ground level. Again, we'll talk about the complexity of the, of the trenches at another time. Now, both the Allies, the British and the French, and the Germans had anticipated a quick, a quick war on the Western Front. They had planned this war to be over. The problem is it doesn't end as fast as they planned for it to. So, they had all of these guns, all of these, this artillery, but they start running out of ammunition. Now, before I talk about the shell crisis, I almost forgot one reason why these counterattacks fail. 
advanced technology. Here we have a British Vickers gun and a British field howitzer. Below we have a German howitzer or probably a 155 howitzer and the German Maxim gun. The reason why these flanking attacks that occurred during the race to the sea failed is because attackers had to first attack across open ground where the opposing side dropped artillery from these guns on top of them at long distances. Remember, these plans set forth before the war had assumed that, you know, had sort of taken into account the technology of Napoleon. Napoleon had the same technology of the Civil War, where guns were literally firing into the face of onrushing uh, attackers. These guns can fire three, four, and sometimes five times the distance, all the way to and even beyond the horizon. So troops have to face a longer distance be under artillery fire. Once they're within firing distance of the enemy trenches or enemy positions themselves, they have to face this, something that previous European wars, European armies had not faced, automatic weapons. So you're approaching the German position if you are a French uh, infantryman and you face a maximum gun spitting out approximately 450 rounds a minute. Or if you're a German attacking a British position, you face this, the Vickers gun, which fired at approximately 500 rounds per minute. And they could fire almost continuously, just stopping long enough to put a new feed belt, new ammunition belt into the gun. The reason why? These things are water-cooled. That big round tube right there, that is a water jacket. And as long as you keep water on that barrel, it will stay cool and fire almost continuously. You don't have to stop and let it cool down or even fire and burst. You can hold the trigger down and just let it go. Now, of course, this means these are very cumbersome weapons, which means they're used mainly in defense. They, you can't move them that well. Offensive action means that you got to move. Defensive action means that you're just sitting in one place defending. And, of course, these guns are excellent at it. Well, whoops. By 19 by the end of 1914 and early 1915, the both sides are starting to run out of especially heavy ordnance, heavy artillery. This becomes known as the shell crisis. And the shell crisis comes to a head by May of 1915. This will actually bring down the British government. And when I say bring down, I don't, I don't mean that the government collapses. What, what I mean is that the ruling party in Great Britain will lose the confidence of the people and new elections will be forced to be, be forced uh, upon, you know, upon the government. You'll have to have new elections. And of course this brings new people into the government. Two interesting people, one is Winston Churchill, but the other one is the new Minister of Munitions. The Minister of Munitions is a new position created just for this war. And the man in charge of the minister, Ministry of Munitions is a fellow by the name of Lloyd George. Now Lloyd George is important because he will help Great Britain, well, build you know, new, not only new weapons, but also have the ammunition in order to fight the war. But in doing so, he will cut his chops, and by the end of the war, he will be the Prime Minister. He will be the head of the British government. Now, I'm going to end this particular lecture with talking about America and what was going on in the war before we actually talk about the rest of the war and how America gets involved, because, you know, I don't want these lectures to be incredibly long. What I'm going to do is tonight I'm going to put this one up so that you guys can watch it maybe during class. It's about an hour long. Uh, and then I'll put another one up so that you can watch it, watch it sometime during the week. And then I will put up the other lecture about the 20s and 30s, maybe in two parts, later on this week. So let's finish up with this slide, actually the next two slides, and talk about what America was doing between 1914 and 19, 1917. Now, the United States is not in the war. World War I starts, 
in August of 1914, but the United States does not enter. Most Americans don't want any part of the war. American popular opinion is that this is a European war, and thus it should be fought by Europeans. Now, the point that you need to remember is while most Americans want to stay out of the war, many Americans want to be involved in the war in order to make some money. American factories, for example, will be contracted with to build weapons. These artillery shells right here are being built, are being made in American factories for British guns. This is one way Lloyd George is able to build up the British military as fast as he can. Britain, being a very wealthy country prior to the war, will spend much of its capital buying weapons from the United States. So companies like Winchester, Remington, Singer Sewing Machines will build everything from artillery shells, ammunition, rifles, electronic components for radios. Ford will supply cars and trucks to the British and also the French war efforts. The problem is, is as this buying spree goes on from 1914 to 1915 to 1916, the Allies start running short of capital. They start running short of cash. They're spending all of their wealth in order to fight this war. As a result, France and especially Great Britain approach American banks. And when I say American banks, I'm not talking about your local bank down the street. I'm talking about the Morgan Bank. I'm talking about the large investment banks in Wall Street. And I apologize, I just hit the uh, computer right there for loans so that they can buy more guns and more weapons. They also go to the, you know, the, uh, the factories themselves and ask, can they buy it on credit? So the Allies are going into debt to fight this war. Now, in 1915, America almost enters the war. Why? Well, it has something to do with you know, freedom of the seas. <clears throat> in 1915, the British liner Lusitania, this is a British liner, and again, I there I hit the, t the uh, screen again. The British liner Lusitania is torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat, an unter de sea boat. Yes, that's it, what U-boat stands for. It stands for under the sea boat. Now the Germans had warned all Americans to stay off of British flagged vessels. But about 200 Americans were on board uh, the, uh, the Lusitania and about 180 of them will die as a result. Now why was the Lusitania sunk? Well, the Germans claimed at the time that the Lusitania was carrying in her cargo holds contraband war items, artillery shells, things like that. The British said no, she was a peaceful passenger liner. And of course, since the British dominated the sort of the news coming out of Europe, they controlled the, the flow of news and information, this was the story in most American papers. However, in the 1990s, a uh, submersible, one of these little robot RO ROVs, went into the hold of the Lusitania as it laid on the seafloor just south of Ireland and confirmed that the Lusitania was, in, was indeed carrying, um, carrying ordnance, which, under the laws of war, made her a legitimate target to be sunk. Of course, in the American papers after the Lusitania was sunk in 1915, no mention of this was made because, of course, the British were not going to, you know, fess up to the fact that they were using the passengers as a human shield. Now, we'll talk about the Lusitania again in the next lecture. But one of the things that you need to remember about the Lusitania is that the American government almost came into the war in 1915. The only thing that kept the United States out was the Germans promised not to sink ships that were passenger liners without first surfacing the U-boat, declaring their intentions, 
and giving the passengers time to get off. Of course, this meant that the U-boat would be vulnerable, and it defeated defeats the 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 main strength of a submarine, which is stealth, being able to strike without anybody knowing you ever were, were there in the first place. At the same time, Americans are watching, not on TV, but instead in their minds as they read newspapers, watching what's going on in Europe. And they get to see the bloodbath that is World War I. They get to see these battles like Verdun, Jutland, and the Somme. I want you guys to remember these battles because we're not going to talk about them right now. We're going to talk about them in the next lecture that I'm going to post tomorrow. So tomorrow afternoon, look for another one of these to be posted. But Americans are getting to see this. And on the one hand, some Americans are starting to say, we've got to get involved because this is a terrible tragedy. On the other side, you have many Americans saying, no, we don't want to get involved in this because look at the brutality, look at the death, look at the destruction. And one of the big reasons why many Americans don't want to get involved in the war is this. Oops. This is a map, if I can get the pop-ups to quit coming up. This is a map of people of German ancestry in 1900. Those areas in dark blue are there are those where you have a thousand people or over per county. People of German descent are the most numerous people in the United States today, and they were even more prominent back in 1900 to 1910. So many Americans, while they fled to get away from the German political system, still did not want to fight in a war where they could possibly be be fighting on the side of you know again well fighting on this not on the side fighting against extended family members fighting against people that they still knew and this is one reason why Americans wanted to stay out of the war now next class period as I said I'm going to end this lecture right here because Right here, I think I've been lecturing for, yeah, about uh, an hour and five minutes. We're going to talk about Verdun. We're going to talk about Jutland. We're going to talk about the Somme. We're going to talk about the trenches themselves. And then we're going to talk about why America got involved in this giant calamity and this, in, this increasing bloodbath of, of human suffering and human misery. And then, of course, we will end that lecture talking with the outcome of World War I and how it really didn't fit into what, you know, the reasons why America got involved in the war in the first place. So I'm going to end this lecture right here and we'll pick it, pick this up again. Um, again, look for uh, the second half of this lecture sometime on Monday afternoon. And I will see you guys, well, I won't see you guys, but you will see me uh, then. I won't see you for another, well, almost two weeks. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and hopefully you will remember what we've talked about in this lecture because next lecture we'll be talking about the war and talking explicitly about America's involvement in the war. I will talk to you guys later. Peace out.